it's biblical to go out into the uh, highways and byways and get people to come in. So my task is to talk about MOOCs and um, copyright management for massively open online courses. I'm, my bona fides, I've already done enough talking so that you probably know. Uh, I'm Kevin Smith. I'm the director of the Office for Copyright and Scholarly Communications at Duke University. Um, Bruce isn't here, so I can still say this. I'm, I'm a librarian and a lawyer. I am also, as I've been explaining to my audiences recently, dealing with the malady known as Bell's palsy, which means that half of my face is partially paralyzed. It's getting better, but I can still, I think, justifiably tell you that you have the rare opportunity to listen to a lawyer who can only talk out of one side of his mouth. <laughs> um, I didn't want to say that while Bruce was still here. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, so my, my first goal here is to say just a few introductory things about MOOCs for those of you who have dropped in from another planet and haven't heard about them, and then talk about some copyright issues. So what is a MOOC? It's a massively open online course. Uh, by massive, we mean tens of thousands of participants. Uh, the biggest one that Duke has done had an initial enrollment of 170,000 students. Uh, they're open, meaning anyone can enroll. There are no prerequisites, and there are intended to be no barriers other than internet access. We, and, uh, the accessibility is a big one, and I saw <laughs> Judy made a face at me as I said that. Um, but what I mean is there's no cost for them. There are no required purchases to take a MOOC. Uh, at least the ones that, that Duke has done. They are entirely online and asynchronous. There are discussion forums and there are designated times when the instructor will be part of the discussion forum. But other than that, there is no time requirement. I've just completed my first MOOC. After working with them for about 18 months, I finally decided to take one. And I did, I'm not intending to brag, but I, because of my schedule, I did all six weeks of the MOOC in two and a half weeks because it was all available and that's when I had the time to do it. Um, and course, I just want to point out that at least the aspiration is to make the experience as similar as we can to an on-campus course. Um, I don't think we, I think we approximate it. I don't think we get there. Um, although the may be better, we have had faculty say, that the reason they want to teach a MOOC is because I've never thought this course worked well in a 14-week forum. It should be two six-week courses. And now I can finally do it the way I want. I can do it better in some sense because I have more flexibility than the traditional on-campus course. So when this slide was prepared, and it was originally prepared about six months ago, we had done 13 MOOCs. There were 12 more in development. I think more of them have launched since then. So we have considerable experience compared to everybody else uh, with doing MOOCs. So far we've had over 650,000 unique res non-unique registrants. I think that should say unique registrants, shouldn't it? I hope that's what it means. Uh, it, it, we've gotten really interesting feedback from the participants uh, that I'll say more about in a minute. But it is a rapidly changing environment, as I'm sure you know. Since we started, revenue models have changed, uh, contractual models have changed, all sorts of things have changed just in the 18 months uh, since Duke first got involved. This is one of the most interesting slides to me, is who MOOCs? And these are the people who MOOC with Duke. This is getting I'm beginning to sound like Mr. Seuss. Who moocs with Duke? You know? <laughs> I mook with Duke. No, never mind. Um, about two-thirds of our participants have been from outside the United States, and there's the breakdown of where they come from. One of the things I think this, this reminds us, a lot of the debate that's going on in higher education, in the press, sometimes amongst faculties, is about, you know, will the MOOC put me out of a job? Are our students being ill-served by MOOCs? But the fact is, the MOOCs are not, are not aimed at our students, by and large. They are aimed at people 
who would never show up on our campus. And I think it's really important to remember that. This is a kind of global outreach. It is not fundamentally, certainly not uh, in my experience at Duke, an attempt to change the way we teach day to day, although with the, with the opportunity to flip classrooms and do other kinds of experiments, we definitely hope that it will improve the pedagogy on our campus, but not by simply firing all our instructors and requiring MOOCs. I, th that's a, a straw man, as far as I'm concerned, that misses the reality of this demographic. The other thing is that over 80% of our MOOC participants already have college degrees. It's not the benighted masses. Um, you know, I think the, the, the rhetoric tends to go one way or the other, and the truth is somewhere in between. This is a well-educated group of people who are doing things for enrichment for a whole variety of goals, many of which we can't understand. That's one of the reasons that completion statistics, I think, are misleading. Because whether or not somebody completes the MOOC by doing all the quizzes, participating X number of times in the discussion forums, whatever the criteria are, really depends. It doesn't tell us whether they met their goals. It doesn't tell us whether they got what they wanted out of the class. There may be no way to know that. But I do think we need to have a certain humility towards things like completion statistics and saying, oh, this MOOC failed because only 10% of the enrollees uh, completed the class. I just don't think we know that. We've also seen a wide range of ages, literally from 6 to 80. Um, we did have one story that I love about a man who enrolled his whole family in a MOOC. And this was something they did together, his children, his wife. And he wa you know, watched the video lectures and talked about it and participated in a MOOC as a family activity, which again is part of my point. They may not have all completed the MOOC in the sense of doing all the assignments, but they, I, I hope, and from what they told us, they got what they wanted out of the class. And that's, as I said, that's just cause for a little bit of humility. So why should libraries care? Uh, you probably know this. Uh, it is potentially a disruption of our models for teaching and learning in a lot of different ways. Uh, it's large, the change is very fast, and it's largely externally driven. We don't have a lot of control. Um, and there is a lot of uptake, but in an environment that's asking some very challenging questions about cost and about quality. Um, as I've said, I think sometimes our answers to those questions have been simplistic, um, that we need to have some humility in answering those questions. Of course, cost is just something we have to deal with. So my point is that the MOOCs are a laboratory for changing models of education. And as such, they're a laboratory for changing models of library service as well. And one of the places that those new models really become critical is in the issues of copyright and permission. I think, by and large, our libraries are the places where people look for information about um, copyright and permission. And it's, an, it's a real opportunity for growth and for service to something that is happening on our campuses and that has a tremendous potential for disruption in both the positive and the negative sense. I'd also point out that what's really happening with MOOCs is that they are a, a huge experiment in the social construction of learning. They are extremely social spaces. A lot of the learning, most of the participants tell us that the most important thing for them were the discussion forums. And I'll, I'll just tell you my own MOOC experience, which is only, I just finished the class this past week. I said, these discussion forums are, are chaotic. I'm not interested. I don't need the credit. I don't know that I'm going to play in the discussion forums. I'm just going to listen to the lectures, do the readings, and take the quizzes. Because that, you know, I went to law school. That's the typical law school <laughs> education and attitude. Spoon feed it to me. I'll give it back to you, and we're done. Um, I finally did go into the discussion forums and came to believe 
what we've been told by the participants, that these are a place where really interesting learning happens. As I said, a lot of these participants have college degrees. A lot of them are, in fact, already experts in the field. And they're taking MOOCs to get a different perspective or a different angle. Um, so that's one way in which these are social spaces. Another thing that's happening, of course, is the flipping of classrooms. That is where traditional students are being told to enroll in a MOOC in order to get the content. And then the class becomes much more a place for social learning. Um, so again, this means that we're in a situation that we cannot ignore. That you know, these are having a significant impact on the way students learn. And libraries can either get involved and figure this out and help, or they risk becoming irrelevant. And I, I say in almost every presentation I give, we librarians spend a lot of time fussing about, complaining about, and worrying about what the future is going to be. The best way to see to it that the future is something we can live with is to take a role in shaping it, whether that means publications or whether it means MOOCs. Uh, the more we're willing to get involved from the start and say, we want to make this happen, the less cause we're going to have to complain about the future. So end of sermon. I was trained as a preacher <laughs> before I was trained as a librarian or a lawyer, so I sort of run home to mama there <laughs> and preach sermons. So, so let's talk about copyrights in MOOCs. Um, two really, two I think different issues and two issues that at least at Duke and I know in other, um, no wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. So two different issues here. One is the ownership of online content. Big controversies going on. You may have seen the AAUP came out with a statement that was really about patent ownership, but they kept throwing in the same threats exist for online courses. They never documented it, but they kept throwing that into their report. Um, so questions about who owns the online content. Is it work for hire? Are there issues of joint authorship? There's almost nothing created in the digital world that isn't actually a work of joint authorship. What are our campus policies about course ownership? Are they different than our campus policies about the ownership of copyright in journal articles and books? And what kind of contractual obligations have we entered into? What kind of relationships do we have that are governed by some kind of contract? So those are one set of issues. And then the other set of issues is using third party materials. Um, can I? put this in my lecture video? Can I distribute this reading to my participants? Uh, those are the questions that my office is dealing with all the time. Um, I think there are three different things we need to distinguish. Linking, which is almost always legally not a problem, but which creates some practical issues, including issues about accessibility, uh, both for disabled people and for anybody, especially when, they're, when you're talking about a global audience. Um, because you know you can just link to a YouTube video and the chances are there's no copyright liability but how many of your students will be able to get to it. Um, another question is use in the actual courseware. Use of third party content in lecture videos. This is a case where I think there's a very strong argument for transformative fair use and I'll tell you about that. Another way in which third party content is used is as assignments. Um, Here's a reading. Please read it. In those cases, when we're not talking about openly licensed materials, we think the fair use argument is much weaker because we're distributing to a huge group of people who are not all our students. So those are cases where we've been, by and large, trying to seek permission. And I'll tell you some stories about that as we go along. That is, if I have time, and it would be a good idea if I paid attention to what time it is. One thing that is hard for our instructors to realize, they're used to having certain rights in a classroom, right? You can perform or display anything you want as long as you use a lawfully made copy in a face-to-face -face classroom. An educational exception that you can drive a university through. Um, it just doesn't apply. It just doesn't apply to the MOOC environment. 
the professor may think she's teaching the same class, but there are more restrictions. Um, likewise, the TEACH Act, which those of us who know anything about the TEACH Act know is included, is intended, included in the law with the intention of facilitating online education. But it still doesn't imagine a MOOC platform. Uh, there are various things it requires that classes be limited to students who are enrolled in a course that is a regular part of the systematic mediated instructional activities of a nonprofit educational institution. That's almost never true of the MOOCs. And it normally doesn't allow the con content to be downloaded. But in fact, we want students to be able to download the lecture videos. Sometimes that's the only way on various devices, for example, that they can participate. Um, so again, they become, it becomes very problematic to apply the TEACH Act, even though this is what it was meant to do. You know, this is what happens with Congress. Um, and the TEACH Act, more than most, is a, uh, is a great example of the legislative sausage-making factory. Um, but it, it really doesn't work very well in the MOOC environment. So what we're talking about is fair use. If we can apply fair use, that's probably what we need to rely on. And where the limitations of fair use make us skeptical about its application, we have one of two options, to get permission for the work or to find openly licensed materials to take the place of the works that... And by the way, we've been very successful. I was probably going to say this later. Um, some of our classes, we've been very successful when working with the faculty members to track down open access materials. Um, a class on foreign affairs, U.S. foreign policy. Really, we've been able to find reports written by um, NGOs, blog posts, all kinds of stuff that has, you know, the professor said, wow, I didn't know this existed. So I, you know, I, all of a sudden, I don't have to rely on the textbook that I use in my class. I don't have to get permission for these journal articles that I thought I wanted my participants to read because the same ground is covered by openly accessible materials. That's been a wonderful opportunity for our faculty to learn more about what's out there. And for us, I shouldn't. So let's talk about ownership. I don't know what that picture means, but I liked it, you know? <laughs> Let's talk about ownership for a minute. By its bare terms, the definition of work made for hire in the Copyright Act would seem to very clearly include faculty work, academic work. Even those journal articles and books that most of us have policies that say we're not going to claim those as work for hire. Most of our institutions don't claim journals and books, uh, partly because they don't want to get into the business of signing all of those contracts with publishers. Um, they want to leave that to the faculty. And there was a long tradition of the courts recognizing what was called a teacher exception. But there are a couple of things to know about the teacher exception. One, no court has formally applied it. It was an exception to the idea of work made for hire. No court has formally applied it since the adoption of the 1976 Copyright Act, which defines work for hire and independent contractor work much more carefully than the older Copyright Act did. So it may not even have survived. We just don't know. And the teacher exception actually never arose in a context where the dispute was between the faculty member and the employing institution. It was always the case that some third party had used the work, the faculty member sued them, and the third party defended by saying, you're not the copyright holder, your institution is. In those cases, courts have said, no, no, we're not going to call this a work for hire. The author, the faculty member, is entitled to bring the lawsuit. In the few cases we've had, and thank God they are few, where the conflict has been directly between the employing institution and the faculty member, courts have not recognized a teacher exception. In fact, they have found work made for hire, even in one case where there was a policy that said faculty work will not be made, will not be considered work made for hire. The court found that it still was because the policy was not a signed document by both parties, and that's what's required to take something out of the bucket of work for hire. So probably institutions could claim these things as work for hire. Most of them don't want to. A few do. 
Uh, at Duke, we've worked very hard to revise our policy to say to the faculty, we are not claiming ownership over the courses you create, even though we're giving you a stipend to create them, uh, extraordinary resources, even though we're doing that, um, we don't want to claim them as work for hire. What we do want is to create a license that you, the copyright owner, give to us in order to make it possible for us to do what we have to do as part of our contractual relationship with Coursera. It's already getting complicated. And then there's the question of joint authorship. We have at least one MOOC that was created by one of our faculty members and a faculty member at our dreaded rival, UNC Chapel Hill. <laughs> we actually like one another except two days a year um, when we play basketball. Maybe three now when we play football, because Duke actually has a chance now. <laughs> anyway, um, and then there's the issue of content that may be created by other people, and there's the issue, of course, of content that is contributed by participants in the discussion forums. So there's a fairly complex set of potential relationships that need to be dealt with, and they can't be de dealt with just by a campus policy. Even if the campus policy is effective, um, the policy by itself won't deal with all of these issues. Sometimes campus policies do claim courseware as work made for hire. Often the reason for that is the extraordinary, the provision of extraordinary resources. Um, When, here's the point I want to make, it's not actually in the slide, but here's the point I want to make. Who owns the class is a political issue, but legally probably not very important. What is more important is can the various parties do what they want with a particular course. And that's a matter, most of the time, of licensing. Our policies should really, they can settle the ownership issue any way they want, what they really need to do is take into account the interests of different parties and make sure that those interests are dealt with in some form of licensing. So if the institution claims that the class is work made for hire and owned by the institution, then they're immediately going to say, but you as the author can do all these various things. You can insist that we always attribute it to you. You can insist that you can use it even if you go to another institution. You can use it for a flipped classroom. Those are all licenses. Or we can say, you, the faculty member, own the um, intellectual property, own the copyright in this class, but you give to us, Duke University, this is how we do it, a fairly broad license to use and reuse the course. Um, so there the copyright is owned by the faculty creator. There is ab absolutely no question that if she leaves Duke and goes to another institution, she can offer the course. Although, as part of this policy, we've required, and I think most of our faculty wouldn't have a problem with this, that they give credit to the university so that they acknowledge that the course was created with the help of Duke University, which would probably kill it for use as a, a MOOC from another university anyhow, but that's another question. Another thing that is relevant here are conflict of interest policies. So most of our universities have policies about faculty teaching at other institutions. Uh, specifically teaching a class that would, for example, directly compete with one of the university's offerings. Um, usually these policies say that uh, you at least have to get clearance through your dean or your provost to teach a course that's directly competing uh, or whether it's online or not online, but more likely online, or a course that would teach a class in a way that would impede your obligations, your primary obligations to your employer. So for example, if one of our faculty said, I don't want to play in the Coursera sandbox that Duke has contracted for, I want to contract directly with Udacity, which is doing this with individual faculty members, to teach a class then we would have this conflict of interest policy uh, issue. And there would at least have to be some discussion between the faculty member and their dean or the provost. One of the things that's happened, this is specific with Coursera, is we have this complex, complex 
um, of contractual relationships. The university with the individual instructor, the university with the platform, and the platform has now asked for contracts with the individual instructors. As a matter of fact, we said we kind of had a problem with that. So did a lot of the other Coursera courses, um, universities. And ultimately, Coursera revised those agreements. So they're actually, they, it's Coursera's way of making sure that legally they're on sound ground, solid ground, I guess, to not mix my metaphor. And they're entitled to do that. But what's happened is we've made sure that those contracts are between the instructors and us. And then we have the contract with Coursera. In other words, the two, um, yeah, you can see the relationship. I can't point when I'm behind the screen. Uh, so that we still get to the same point where everybody can do what they want to be able to do, but we try and keep the relationship institution with platform and instructor with institution. Uh, we've tried to avoid that middle arrow or that arrow down at the bottom. All of that to get to what I really wanted to talk about, which is using third party content. I've already said that there's usually no legal issue with linking. A number, of, no court that I'm aware of has found copyright liability for simply putting up a link to something that is freely available on the internet. Uh, the one case I know of that involved that where liability was found, it was two competitors and one was deep linking into the other's website uh, to avoid advertising that the competitor had sold but, get, but mined data that they had collected. Uh, and that actually wasn't a copyright case. It was a case uh, decided under unfair trade practices law. Um, a link might be to infringing content, and one can imagine the imposition of secondary liability, contributory infringement liability, but courts have resisted doing that because of the chilling effect it would have on the internet as a whole. Um, also, we actually never know these days whether or not content is really unauthorized because content is turning up with the authorization of rights holders all over the place on the web. Um, so it's just very hard to know. Uh, good faith is important. We should always be trying to do what's right. Um, and generally, in the case of linking, good faith is going to protect us. I often tell my instructors, if you absolutely know that it's unauthorized, that, you know, it's last night's episode of NCIS, and it's on a platform that isn't CBS's, you probably shouldn't link to it. <laughs> but, but most of the time, you can't be sure of that, and the link is not going to be a legal problem. Now, it does have accessibility issues. Are they going to be reliable? That's the major reason our faculty don't like linking. Um, what about access for people in other countries where YouTube may be blocked, for example? Um, and then what about access for the disabled? We have agreements with Coursera to try and provide at least for some minimal accessibility adaptations to the courses. Um, but we can't do that with content that people link to. So that becomes an issue as well. By the way, it's a, and Judy will, will jump all over me if I get this wrong, but I do want to point out that nobody is required to participate in MOOCs. So that gives us a little bit of breathing space. Where we don't have that breathing space is if we flip the classroom and say, you all have to take this. Then we have to, there are a number of things we have to do. We have to observe FERPA restrictions, privacy restrictions, and we have to make sure that there are accommodations for disabled students. Yes? No, oh, you're looking at that. <laughs> oh, I thought you wanted to. I thought you were laughing at what I had said, which wasn't meant to be funny. OK. So the question we ask in terms of using content in courseware is, do you need that content or just some content like that? Is it good enough if you have a picture of a tomato? Oops. So why are not there? OK. We actually had this, a professor who teaches evolutionary genetics. So apparently sometime in its history, the tomato did something remarkable. I don't know what it was. 
but apparently it did. And our professor had an image essentially of a farmer's market table full of tomatoes. And we said, where'd you get that? He said, I have absolutely no idea. Perfectly fine for him to use that in his slides in a face-to-face -face teaching environment, because there's a big exception to the copyright law. Not so fine in a MOOC. So we said, what if we find you another picture of tomatoes? It's OK with me. So we found openly licensed images. We do a lot of that, either finding licensed material that has an open license, a Creative Commons license, or using databases that have a blanket license that allows this particular use. And I'll tell you, we, we looked at the AP Images database, which allows editorial uses. We looked at their definition and said, we don't know whether MOOCs fit or not. We called them up, and they said they do. So that's great. And we're very happy with that. Um, but if it's just some content like this, the easiest thing to do is replace it with um, either public domain or open licensed content. If they want this content, this exact content, then we go through our regular set of questions about anything that's copyrighted. First of all, is it copyrighted or is it in the public domain? Secondly, is there a license that addresses the use? Then thirdly, is it fair use? Um, and that's really where we put a lot of weight, especially on this idea of transformation. And then finally, if we've gone through all of those, and yes, it's copyrighted, no, there's no license, we don't think it's fair use, can we get permission? That set of questions is always the set of questions in that order that you should ask yourself. So the real issue becomes transformative fair use. A use is transformative when the work becomes part of something new or is repurposed in a way that creates new meaning and doesn't compete with the traditional markets of the rights holder. That's a rough and ready definition that's assembled from court cases that have found for transformative fair use, including the Bill Graham versus Dorling Kinderly, Kindersley case that uh, Bruce described to you. A lot of the use of materials in courseware is transformative fair use. Because what's happening is it's being incorporated into a lecture to make a different point. It is being subjected to criticism and comment. This is what the courts have traditionally recognized as transformative, as fair use. We started calling it transformative, but if you think about it, the, the, the paradigm of fair use in academia is the quotation. And that's exactly what it is. It's a transformative fair use. A short part of a copyrighted work is incorporated into a new work and given new meaning by context, by criticism, and by comment. So if this content is required, then we ask a further set of questions to determine how much is it needed and how much of it is needed. You know, do you really, really need this content, and are you using no more than you need to make your point? If you do, we think you have a good case for transformative fair use. And the great thing about those questions is they're also questions about good teaching. The fact is, the better the pedagogy, the stronger the argument for transformative fair use. Because I'm taking just what I need to make my new argument and I'm using it to do something new. When we get it, when we really dig into these questions and they become questions about good teaching, um, it's really very exciting. And we've had some great conversations. I'll tell you a story that I probably don't have time to tell you, but I'll do it anyway. Um, we had a professor who was teaching a class on reasoning and argumentation. That's the one that got 170,000 enrollees partly because it was in this non-technical field that you know, everybody, want, everybody needs to think and talk. So uh, 170,000 people registered. He wanted to incorporate into his lecture video the entire, an entire nine-minute skit from Monty Python. Anybody know which one? You do, don't you? The Argument Clinic, right? You all seen the Argument Clinic? <laughs> it's perfect for what he wanted to do. 
But when we had this conversation about, you know, how much do you really need to do what, we ultimately came to the conclusion that using the entire thing probably wasn't fair use. Uh, I said that a specific way and I'll come back to it. So we tried to contact the rights holder to get permission. Well, I'm here to tell you Monty Python will not return my phone calls. <laughs> so we were unable to get permission, not because they didn't want to let us do it, just because we couldn't get them to respond. Which is probably the biggest problem with permission that we have. We also know that the video is on YouTube and authorized. Monty Python has their own YouTube channel. They got sick of users uploading poor quality skits. So they uploaded their own videos. We knew that about their history. So we know it's authorized in YouTube. It's likely to be stable. It's probably not going to be taken down by the copyright holder since they put it up there in the first place. So what we did is we incorporated the link. And in his lecture, Walter says, please go and watch this video. And then when they come back, he talks them through what they've watched. And we took four clips from the nine minute video, none of them more than 15 to 20 seconds, and incorporated them into his lecture videos because those are the things he absolutely needed to make his point. And that's where we thought we had the strongest transformative fair use argument. So we're trying to rely on fair use in a very responsible way and also using linking and as other kinds of open content to supplement that. By the way, you know, there's, I can't do this as well with the Bell's palsy, but that moment where the man in the argument clinic says, that's not an argument, that's just contradiction. Well, that's exactly <laughs> what Walter wanted to talk about. You know, that, that, that little clip, of course it made perfect sense to put that in, but not to put the whole thing in. The whole business about knocking one another on ham with hammers on their head. You know, you've walked into the getting hit on the head with a hammer clinic. Um, that was less relevant, <laughs> but very funny. When we're thinking about transformative fair use, we actually just ask three very simple questions. And as I say, they're questions about good teaching, good research. Does it really help me make my new point? Will it help my readers or viewers to get my new point? Have I used no more than is necessary to make my new point? I call that the Goldilocks rule. Is it just right? That's why I have that picture. Besides, I just really like that picture. Um, if the answer to is yes to all of those questions, A, we've made a really good pedagogical decision, and B, we've probably made a very responsible transformative fair use decision. As assignments, where material is distributed to all of the participants in a way that they can download and you know, carry off with them, we think the fair use argument is much less strong. There's certainly less of this transformative nature. <coughs> so instead, we've been trying to get permission. And the frustrations of trying to get permission have driven us increasingly to rely on open access material. So I told you about the foreign policy class. We've gotten permission for some material for almost every class. Um, we've also had really frustrating experiences uh, trying to get permission. Monty Python won't return my call. Uh, there is one publisher I won't mention by name who every time we contact them, we are given a different representative in a different department. And that representative does not understand MOOCs every single time. We have to answer the question, how many people are enrolled in the class? Well, it doesn't work that way. Let me explain a MOOC to you. Um, it's just been so frustrating that uh, we've been driven to open access materials because a lot of the time we simply can't get permission. Again, because the right people, the people we're talking to, don't understand what it is we're asking. Um, when we've talked to the right people, and by the way, they're often the marketing people, they understand uh, and we have had better luck getting permission when we make the case that, you know, 70,000 people have self-identified an interest in this topic, and your book is going to be recommended to 
all of those 70,000 people by a recognized expert in the field, and all we're asking you to do is let us give one chapter of that book to students. Some publishers have figured that out. They've asked for statistics. They've asked for linking to ways to buy the book. Um, and we've had good success sometimes. And we've had some frustrating experiences. My favorite frustrating experience, <laughs> well, yeah, getting permission. The results vary greatly. Getting a response is the first tri trick, <coughs> task. And as I said, if you emphasize the mutual benefit especially if you're talking to the marketing folks, as opposed to the rights department. Because it's with the rights department that we've had all these frustrations, just trying to get them to understand what we're asking. Or we get an answer that says, we do all of that through the CCC. Well, the CCC's choices don't work. They just don't. We end up with a fee of $26,000 for a three-page, this really happened, for a three-page excerpt. Oh, sure, we'll let you do that, but we license through the CCC, and their mechanical process gave us a fee of $26,000. Needless to say, we didn't use that material. <laughs> um, one case I had, it involved um, the, an image. The movie poster from Driving Miss Daisy with Mor Morgan Freeman in the front seat and Jessica Tandy in the back. The professor was talking about race relations. She wanted to use that. We talked to her about, you know, what do you do with it? Well, not really much. I just want it in the background as I talk. Okay, we didn't think we had a really good fair use argument there. So we contacted the movie company. Went through the usual hoops of getting different people every time, but finally did get permission, sort of. What I got was an email that said, this should do it. We're, I think we're set now. The enclosed letter should deal with your request. And I opened the enclosed letter, and it said, what you want is covered by the Section 110 face-to-face -face teaching exception. <laughs> Through all of that, we still had not conveyed the nature of the MOOC. And you know, there was a point, at that point, I said, they're trying to give us permission. They're not good at it, but they're trying to give us permission. And of course, you, uh, you know, this is different than talking to an academic publisher. It's not really surprising to me that a movie company didn't get what a MOOC was. Um, they did their best, and finally we decided that we could use that. And if we, you know, they had tried to give us permission. The letter was non-responsive, but they had tried. I think I already said this, that when we have been able to get permission to use a chapter in a book or something like that, publishers usually want this information. This is really, really important for them. Uh, first of all, to sell their book to participants who are interested in more on the same topic. And also to understand more about the MOOC environment. It's the same data that we're collecting, so it makes perfectly good sense for us to share this. Um, hopefully we can reach a point where we recognize a mutual benefit um, once we get past the lawsuits and that sort of thing. Um, Anything else I wanted to say about this, about getting permission? No? I can't think of anything else, so I'm to this point where I want to take any questions. Yeah? Well, you're a lot better at negotiating those things than I am, and so I, you know, my first reaction is probably not, and I'm not sure how that language would work. Um, how would, what would you change about the authorized users that would include the participants in a MOOC? Um, so I, you know, I, I really don't know how we would do that. Um, like I said, people like you, people who are cleverer than I am at negotiating those, might figure that out. We have just acted on the assumption that none of our database licenses allow us to give access to the 170 people from all over the world who are participating in a MOOC. We've, we've just assumed that. Um, and I, I don't think we've really thought that we would be able to negotiate uh, licenses that did allow that kind of access. Um, that's really 
the real message about MOOCs is that they are driving us more and more to openly licensed content. And we're finding that that content is out there, which has been great. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's much more an important message than to try and negotiate those database licenses. Yeah. Yeah, I, I should have said this right at the beginning. Yes, we do. Um, from the very start, uh, before we offered any MOOCs, uh, it happened that the person who was coordinating the MOOC effort uh, for the provost's office was one of our AULs, who is now Associate Vice Provost for Online Learning. But um, she came to me and said, what do we need to do about copyright and permission? And I sort of explained what I knew then, which was a lot less than this. Um, sorry about that. And uh, she said, you're going to need help to do this, aren't you? And I said, you bet you I am. So the provost's office has actually funded an intern working in my office. I've had one library school graduate with a, cor a single course in IP who did great. This year I have a, a lawyer who is in library school who's also doing great. Uh, working on permissions, on finding open access materials, and working with the, with the professors to know what's fair use, what requires permission, and where open access content is better. So yeah, we've been involved in that. I've done some of it. My interns have done some of it. And then our Center for Instructional Technology, which is in the library, has actually expanded considerably and is working with every instructor on more on the technical aspects of things, um, on just making sure that the courses run well, on the pedagogical questions. And that's where we often overlap because of my insistence that good fair use policy is also good teaching. Uh, we often have that conversation together. And that way the faculty member gets mad at fewer of, more of us and spreads it. No. Actually, our, you know, our faculty are figuring out that they're figuring this out as they go. They know that we are too. We've mostly had really good relations with, with the faculty. Yeah. Oh. Um, which is not about that, um, which is about the social space that you talked about, so either through your experience or through the anecdotes that you've gotten. Are you hearing, um, not quite sure how accurate, but we all, we're all familiar with the way that with the kind of um, lack of civility <laughs> all the way through like outright research right. on the right. internet and sort of open comments. And so I haven't heard anything about this with me. So it's interesting. Up, and I, I, I would like to know, and I mean, I think it's also partly, you know, in, in this work, the university Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm interested in that. I have not heard of any complaints about in uncivil discourse in the MOOCs. I'm sure it's happened. Uh, I don't think it's become a widespread issue. Certainly, the ones that I've looked at, I've never seen. Would it become a policy question? I suppose it would, but again, it's going to be pretty hard to enforce. Right. Even even harder to enforce than comments on your university's Facebook page. Right. It's going to be much harder to deal with there. Um, yeah, I, I just haven't seen. I did see in the, the class that I took, which was from Northwestern University on law and the entrepreneur. And uh, I did see one of the very first threads was, why does everybody hate lawyers? But I think that was started by a lawyer, so <laughs> it wasn't exactly uncivil. It was more plaintiff than anything else. <laughs> and I, I want to drop the licensing thing totally. I agree that the more you can do to kind of No, I know. I think I know where you're going. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm going in two similar directions. One is uh, because some article I read somewhere last week about Spock small private online courses, mm -hmm. and that Harvard was doing this, and other places were doing this. So much more contained, much smaller enrollment. You kind of know who the enrollees are, even if they're not yours, but they could be your people. In which case, there's no issue with it because it's an outsider. So more well-defined uh, courses, and um, also, you know, there is this move to formalizing, accrediting, whatever, uh, at least certain students who are in these courses. Right. That, that will narrow the, the numbers quite a lot as well. Um, how do we think about those? Is that something that Coursera should be doing, or is that something that institutions should be doing? 
Well, I think. I, th I think the answer is both, I, I, and I, I remembered what I wanted to say about permissions is, of course, you probably know that Coursera has negotiated with a number of publishers, so in the MOOC that I took, there was an entire textbook that was available, uh, it was a Cengage textbook available on the Chegg platform, frustrating as all hell to use, but at least it was available, it was readable. Um, so, you know, they are negotiating with publishers to get these broader permissions to you so that there is now a list of stuff that faculty can look at and say, is there something here that I'd like to use for which prior permission has been arranged? Uh, so that's one way in which Coursera, the platform company, is doing the work. Um, I think, you know, the other question you're asking about license to other universities and such, is there going to be a way that we can adjust the language in our contracts about authorized users that would include students who are sort of temp participants, we tend to say about the, uh, the folks in the MOOC, to distinguish them from our own students. But in those closed classes, perhaps where credit is being offered by the host institution, there may very well be ways to work that into a definition of authorized users. And then there's the other question of licensing um, you know, uh, if Duke offers a course on the Coursera platform, Coursera may actively seek p other institutions that would like to license that class and offer it for credit on their campus. This is where all the controversy in the press has come. It's very, very rare at this point, but it may grow. And there, there's going to be an interesting question of whose resources should be used. Should it be the host institution, or should it be and there is one example of this, the small private college. Well, Duke has a lot more resources, but probably doesn't have the provisions in our licenses, whereas the small private college, the people who would be taking the MOOC are their authorized users already. So there, what might have to happen is there to be a conversation between the two institutions to make sure that students have access as authorized users of small private college to all the resources that they'll need. Lots of places to go with licensing. Thanks very much. <laughs>